Hello team, welcome to my session and today we are going to discuss about CISSP Domain 2 exam summary. My name is Prab Nair. For more information, you can refer my LinkedIn profile. This summary you can review week before the exam or before preparing for CISSP because it gives you a kind of a high level overview what you need to know from the exam point of view. It is based on my experience. So the Domain 2 Asset Security of CISSP start with the classification and categorization so you must be aware about classification categorization so whenever we classify the data the most important thing we consider is the value of the data and for that we need to contact the data owner as a consultant in order to apply any kind of a control i need to know the risk in order to understand the risk i need to know the value of the assets so ultimately understand the value of an assets for that i need to contact the asset owner so first we classify and then we categorize into a specific category. One example is when you're preparing for CISSP, it is not possible for you to remember each and every word till the last day of exam. So what you do, you classify the important area, which is important, and then you will categorize into the small, small notes. And that you can basically re read week before the exam or day before the exam. This is how you classify and categorize. So by this way, you can able to focus on the important area right moving ahead this domain also talk about different states of the data so we have a three states of data data at rest data in use and data in transit so when we're talking about data in transit it means data is basically moving from one system to another system over the network so what kind of a security we can consider at data at rest so answer is we have a two type of encryption link encryption and end to end exam point is link encryption is more secure than end to end encryption end to end works on the application layer and link encryption happen on the data link layer moving ahead next state of data is basically called as a data at rest ppm is the most effective security at data at rest always remember because it offers the hardware based encryption with the use a device based authentication ppm chip in the motherboard because in the case of device is basically lost also still it went in the persistent security while at rest then we have a data in use during a data in use definitely you can't use encryption because encrypted data can't be processed that is a different story in the cloud we call it as a homomorphic encryption but as per cssd we don't have a encryption while data in use so in the data in use alternate of a data security we prefer to use masking mm -hmm. we have a two type of masking static masking and dynamic masking Exam point static masking use in a software environment for testing because we can't use production data for a testing and uh, dynamic masking is basically called on fly how suppose when you call customer care they ask you the last four digit number only because they can see that only because the rest of the information is masked so that is called as a dynamic masking along with that we also use tokenization whenever we have an inter-border data transfer and we need to maintain the secrecy of a data and we don't want to disclose any kind of a data while in transit we can also use tokenization where we just replace your actual value with the token value in banking sector we use that same thing when you go for wallet parking in a ca in a cafes and all that you give your car key against that they give you the wallet number so that wallet number you can basic wallet number whatever you say you can keep it in your pockets so when you come back you just show the wallet number against that they have a key and they will issue the key so this is how the tokenization work Another important thing which is called as an anonymization. Anonymization basically replacing the actual value with some alternate value. Example, my date of birth is 10-8-1989 example. Okay, so they, I will replace that with the 10-89. Uh, so it will not reveal my date of birth or my PIN code is basically replaced with the city. So even say if someone is trying to processing data, they cannot able to reveal any information. So as with a lot of data privacy regulation, we need to do this anonymization, which is happening in the data and use stage. The third thing is called as a uh, data retention. So data at rest, data in transit, and data in use, which is basically a state of data. Moving ahead to the next part called data retention. When data is not in use, we flag the data for archive and move data to the offsite. When we're creating a retention policy, for how long we need to retain data the first the most important thing that must be considered is a legal regulatory requirement because that cannot be oversight so legal regulatory requirement must be followed in your retention policy one major advantage for the company to have a retention policy is that they can protect the data from the liabilities issue example if the retention policy say that you need to retain data for a 10 year then you will retain the data for 10 year after that you can destroy the data immediately 
how we verify the vendor is maintaining the retention policy effectively you can go there you can pick the last five year data and see whether you can able to restore so by this way if you're able to restore effectively it means he follow the retention policy effectively in the retention policy another important thing is basically is that integrity of a data need to be preserved availability of a data need to be preserved and the confidentiality of a data need to be preserved moving ahead in domain two we also talk about gdpr you must know gdpr seven principles and also you should know the data controller and data processor data breach reporting happened in 72 years 72 hours sorry not 72 years 72 hours, 72 hours so any security breach happen you need to report immediately and the timeline in which we need to report is 72 hours please note in a cybex 8th edition it is mentioned wrong which say 24 hours no it is 72 hours in gdpr you must be familiar with the data processor and data control and data subject let me give you an example i go to the bank and i open an account so i am a data subject for the bank bank is the data controller bank creating a services and storing data in the cloud so cloud is a data processor anything happen in the security breach and everything i am asking the bank so bank is a controller he is the ultimate accountable for the data protection of pii and data processor is basically cloud provider so if anything happened in the cloud still the data controller is the one who ultimately accountable to data subject and to the gdpr authority gdpr applicable in the eu anything which is processed out of the eu we need to take permission from the eu authority so there are some countries which is basically comply with the gdpr requirement so they can able to process the data from that particular region countries like australia singapore japan are the countries who comply with the gdpr parameters so by this way they can able to process the data from the gdpr aspects another important thing called data privacy in canada which is called pipda p-i-p-e-d-a so you must be aware about pipda is a privacy regulation which is applicable in eu in order to understand the level of privacy you have a process in your process we conduct the PIA. You must be aware about the PIA definition. Another important thing in the domain two, we talk about the data protection methods. In data protection methods, we have a DLP. Ultimate goal of a DLP is to prevent the exfiltration of a data. Second is called as a DRM. When data leaving the organization, make sure we should able to maintain the persistent security of our intellectual properties, we use DRM. Suppose Netflix is basically upload the movie in their portal and that movies get downloaded from anywhere. If you notice, when you try to take a screenshot from your phone, it gives you error. That screenshot is prohibited. Why? Because they have a DRM solutions. So ultimate goal of a DRM is to protect the intellectual property in a daytime use stage. Then we also using the uh, watermarking for tracking the accountability. So these are the two important protection methods that we basically using for the data. You also need to be familiar with the data life cycle, which we have a create, store use share archive and destroy create is a phase where we classify the data and destroy is a phase we destroy the data csu sad is a life cycle we use in a cloud moving to the next part is in data at rest we also apply the baseline controls because once we classify the data we need to apply the necessary controls on the data and for that the first thing is that scoping we need to understand what controls we need example like i'm building a, a baseline for my for my data center okay so i want to know what are the baselines required so what i pick i pick some control from nist i pick some control from iso i pick some controls from the other standards so that is called as a scoping then i will tailor it as per my business requirement example like one of the standards say that you must have a password so i adopt password as a control and then i tailor it as the eight character in my organization so that is called scoping and tailoring you must be familiar with the scoping and tailoring the next part is called as a standard selections which is i already covered the third thing is basically when data is not in use and then it meets this life cycle and all the lifespan and all we need to destroy the media so we have a three type of media sanitization technique ultimate goal of a media sanitization technique is to make sure the data will be unreadable so for the first technique is called as a overwriting we call overwriting as a process which is a logical way to erase the data so in that case we delete the pointers but problem with that uh, we can we can able to recover those pointers with the help of advanced forensic tools so we basically perform overwriting in that case when we need to reuse the media because it's just a software technique by which we erase the data see the first is called as a formatting where you simply format but still after that pointers are there 
and those pointers can be recovered by anything. That's why we introduced this advanced three type of media sanitization technique in which overwriting actually overwrite the pointers. It means data still there, but it is overwrites on the, with some alternate value. So with the help of advanced forensic tools, we can able to still recover those, those data. So overwriting is not at all a safe method uh, to be used for the uh, this one, which is called as a sensitive data and all that if you want to destroy. But if the data or disk is leaving the organization all that, the second best practice is called as a purging. So purging is basically done by the degaussing, but degaussing can be done in the hard disk because data in hard disk stored in an electronic is called a, uh, the magnetic format. So magnetic formations are basically used to store data. So what we does, we basically place the media in the degausser and by which we physically destroy the data, not disk, destroy the data. But after that, there's no guarantee you can able to reuse the disk. But in the case of SSD, it is not an effective practice because SSD doesn't support the magnetic flux. The third, the most effective technique is called as a physical destruction. But when we already have a degaussing, then why we go for destruction? And if we have a destruction, then why we degauss? See, in some companies, destruction of a media is not possible. It's a lot of costs involved. And that is where to overcome that, some companies, they just simply degauss and they give for the uh, reuse purpose. But if the, if the media is contain a very sensitive information and all that, in that case, they physically destroy the disk. Drilling a hole in the disk is not a safe, but grinding it to pieces is a most effective way to destroy the media. But in the cloud, how to destroy the data? So in the cloud, we destroy the data with the help of crypto eraser. So any question talking about how to destroy data in the cloud, the answer is crypto eraser technique. Another important thing in this domain, talk about labeling and marking. We label the data and we mark it as a top secret secret and all that. Same like RFID is basically a label for you and the information in that RFID is called as a marking. By this way, we can able to identify assets. Then we have an end of life, end of support policy. That's the most important thing which is required from the data lifecycle point of view or disk or a hardware lifecycle point of view or system lifecycle point of view. So these are the important areas we have in the domain too that you must be aware about. Make sure you should review the CBK 6 edition for more information. If you find this video useful, do share in your network. My name is Prabh Nair and thanks for watching this video.